psych. All right, we're not going to really do chapter eight all in 30 minutes and move right into chapter nine, but I think we might be able to get through a significant portion of chapter eight and maybe even talk a little bit about some practice problems and how do we incorporate the idea of synthesis into chapter eight, which is exactly what Dylan was just talking about. Chapter eight involves addition reactions of alkenes. We already know how to make alkenes through elimination. We'll review that in a second. But the addition reaction is taking an alkene and adding things to it. So it's essentially the opposite of elimination. So what, there's, this is the first chapter where up until this point, cha chapters one through seven, are really chapters about developing your skill set in organic chemistry. What we're going to do with chapter eight is take that skill set and start to apply it uh, to particular substrates and particular types of reactions. So let me give you an example. In chapter eight, we're going to take alkenes and do addition reactions of alkenes. Then in chapter uh, nine, we're going to take alkynes and essentially do all the same addition reactions, but then we're going to, instead of applying them to alkenes, we're going to apply them to alkynes. Chapter uh, 10 then takes uh, a whole different type of sub reaction. It says, okay, here are radical reactions, and let's learn about those reactions. <clears throat> then there's a little bit, bit of a break. There's a chapter about synthesis, but remember I told you we're going to do synthesis kind of in line. But to give you a preview of what happens after that, it, it really is, then we're going to talk about alcohols and the reactions of alcohols and how to synthesize alcohols. Then we're going to talk about uh, um, esters or ethers and how to synthesize ethers and the reactions of ethers. Then we're going to talk about double bonds and what are our conjugated double bonds and all the reactions involving conjugated double bonds. And then it just goes functional group by functional group, uh, ketones, aromatic compounds, uh, carboxylic acids, amines, all these other things. And it just really starts to just give you all these reactions. And it just uses all the same skills that you've learned in chapter one through seven. Mm -hmm. So it really isn't anything. Mm -hmm. It really isn't anything new in far, as far as deep basic chemistry, it really is just taking all this stuff you've learned at the beginning of these chapters and now applying it. And so that's really what it is from here on out. And so what I'll do without any further ado is then switch screens and uh, uh, let's kind of start with that and see what's up. All right, waiting for my screen to pop. Okay, an addition reaction of an alkene. Let me make sure I got my chat up, got my participant window up. Remember, I've got everybody muted, but I do have my chat windows up and I have the participant window up. So uh, if you want me to pause and get my attention, try to pop something in chat or raise your hand through the, your Zoom application. All right, so an addition reaction involves uh, something like this. We've got X, Y, and we put X and Y across this double bond. There are a lot of different things that X and Y can be. X and Y can be uh, halogens, HX, or ha halo acids. It could be water, so it could be H and OH, it could be hydrogen gas, so it could be H and H. It could be uh, actual halogen molecules, so that would be like Cl2 or Br2, so it would be X and X. Uh, it could be halohydrin formation, so that would be OH and a halogen. Uh, or you could do two different OH groups, so OH and OH. And what, so there's a, a few different things that we're going to be adding to alkenes. 
they're all going to involve their own unique well not necessarily unique but its own little flavor of mechanism you won't have to know every single mechanism but you will have to know some details about all the mechanisms because ultimately remember back from chapter seven we have to explain the outcome of the reaction in terms of regio selective regio chemistry and stereochemistry and at the end of the day the mechanisms tell you what those uh qualities of regio uh, chemistry and stereochemistry are and so again you don't have to know all of the mechanisms but you do have to know some qualities about all of them in order to be able to to answer them without brute force memorization. All right, so let's think about addition. Addition is the forward reaction, but what would the reaction in the backward direction be? If I take the two, uh, the species that has X and Y on it and I get rid of X, Y, what kind of reaction does that look like? Hopefully you're saying to yourself, that looks like an elimination reaction. And that's really what it is. And so we've talked about the reaction that eliminates X and Y from an alkane and forms a double bond. But now we're gonna talk about the forward reaction. But let's think about this in terms of the energetics uh, and which direction is favored based on the conditions of the reaction. The forward reaction, the addition reaction, let's see, forward. What about delta S in this case? Is entropy going up or is entropy going down? We go from two things to one thing in the forward direction. So delta S is negative. What about delta H? Is there something we can do to sort out delta H for an average elimination reaction? Well, if you think about it, in the reactants for the forward reaction, you've got pi bonds. And you take those pi bonds and you turn them into sigma bonds. And sigma bonds are more stable than pi bonds. And so at the end of the day, the products are lower energy than the reactants, just from this bond analysis. And so that implies that delta H is, uh, delta H is negative as well. So what does delta G do in order for the reaction to be spontaneous? Well, if delta S is negative, then negative T delta S turns into a positive quantity. So delta G equals a negative plus a positive. And so delta G could be positive or negative, and it really depends on temperature. So at the end of the day, the elimination reaction, in order for the re forward reaction to go to go uh, to be favorable it depends on t and what kind of temperature would that be well we want the temperature to be low in order for this quantity to be small so that delta g remains negative let's think about the reverse reaction now the reverse reaction involves Delta, delta S being positive and delta H being positive as well. Uh, if I'm going backwards, then the, the, the state, state functions are simply reversed in their sign. I'm going from one, pro, one reactant to two products, so delta S is positive. I'm going from something that's low energy to something that's high energy, so delta H is positive. So now for delta G, I have a negative, plus a, po a positive value. Wait, sorry, backing that up. Let's try that again. I have a positive value plus a negative value. And so uh, with if negative T delta S, uh, if t delta S is, if delta S is positive, then negative T times that value is negative. So we want this quantity to be as large as possible in order for delta G uh, to be negative. So it does depend on T. And at this case, we'd, we'd say high T. 
So in general, the addition reaction is favored at lower temperatures and the elimination reaction is favored at higher temperatures. Okay. And so that's sort of just a recap of thermodynamics and how that applies to elimination reactions. Now it's time to sort of get into it. Okay, so let's do the first reaction. At the end of the day, I think in this chapter, there's gonna be like 12 reactions that we're gonna to have to go through. This is hydro halogenation. It's weird because you, you think you see hydro and you think water. Really, this means hydrogen. Halogenation should be pretty clear. That means we're going to add an X. So hydrohalogenation is the reaction, the first one that I suggested we would think about. That's where we're going to add HX across the double bond. So if I have a reactant that is an alkene, and I react HX to it, then we're gonna add H and X at these locations. The question is, what goes here and what goes here? At this point, you should see that there's two possibilities. I could have H here and X here, or I could have X there and H there. The two possibilities uh, are the two regioisomers. They're conformational, they're constitutional isomers of each other. And this, in, in this case, it's a regioselective or regiochemical consideration. And so, you know, we'll just use the word regioisomer. I probably won't use that very often. One of the things that we have to think about in this chapter a lot, a lot more than we did before, is the regioselective outcome of the reaction. In this particular reaction, the regioselective outcome is that the halogen is added to the most substituted side, or to the most substituted See if I can spell vinyl right. V I N Y L I C, the most substituted vinylic position. And if you recall, a vinylic position is a position directly attached to a double bond or where the double bond was. There's a word to describe this quality of attaching something to the most substituted vinylic position. What we call this is Markovnikov addition. And we're gonna use this word a lot, Markovnikov. So Markovnikov is this, this quality of regioselectivity where the, the thing that we're adding adds at the most substituted location. Now notice that we did technically add two things. We added a halogen and a hydrogen, but we're gonna often be adding hydrogen. And so we'll call it, instead of saying it's a Markovnikov addition of HX, because that doesn't specify what adds Markovnikov, we'll just say it's a Markovnikov addition of a halogen. And that way we know, okay, the halogen is what gets added at the most substituted location. Uh, the hydrogen will then get added at the least substituted location. Any questions about that? We're gonna, I wanna, we're gonna come back to it in a second and do the mechanism, but I wanna contrast it with an anti-Markovnikov reaction. So this is another reaction that you have to know. And so when I say, this is a reaction that you have to know. Remember, this, my suggestion is, if you're gonna brute force memorize it, then do the note card thing with one side having uh, 
with one side it would be A goes to B with a question mark here, and on the other side it would be A goes with uh, with X there, and the question mark would be what's the product. And so that way you're testing yourself both ways. Okay, so this is the second reaction that you have to know. It's similar to the same rea the reaction we just discussed in the sense that uh, uh, some, some halogen-based acid is the reactant. In addition to the halogen-based reactant, though, we're going to react it in the presence of peroxide. So R-O-O-R, you're going to hear the word roar a lot. And so that just what we're just mean by that is this is some sort of peroxide. It could be hydrogen peroxide or it could be some other alkane or alkyl-based peroxide. It doesn't really matter. What we're going to do is we're going to call it ROOR to specify that it's just any peroxide. So in the presence of peroxide, you get a different result. You get the halogen adding at the least substituted location and the hydrogen added in the most sub, oops, that's an X. And the hydrogen added at the most substituted location. This would be an anti-Markovnikov addition. And remember, it's of X. So remember, we're adding both H and X, but when I say it's anti-Markovnikov, I'm referring to the halogen. All right, so what's, what's going on here? If I take HX and I react it with an alkene, I get a Markovnikov addition, but if I do the same reaction in the presence of peroxide, I get anti-Markovnikov addition. So what's the deal here? What, what, what's going on with that? Now, the answer must essentially be in the mechanism. Now, the anti-Markovnikov mechanism actually is a radical mechanism. And so we're not going to learn that until chapter 10. So that's a mechanism that we just don't have to know at the moment. But what you do have to know is that when I react HX and ROOR, I get anti-Markovnikov addition. So let's just real quick, let's just do a couple of examples. And let's think, if I react this with HBr, what's the product? And if I react this with HI and I do it in the presence of peroxide, what's the product? Okay, so how do we solve these problems? Remember that it's the hydrogen and the halogen are going to add across the double bond at the vinylic positions. So that means I've got to figure out what I'm going to put in each spot at the vinylic positions. So I can draw the backbone of both of the products. And now I can even draw a bond to each location. The question is, what am I gonna put at the end of each of those bonds? Well, what am I gonna do here? In this case, this is HBr by itself. So this is the Markovnikov addition. So that means that the Br is gonna be in the most substituted location. The most substituted location is the one at the top. So that's where the Br goes. So then the hydrogen goes down here. In the other case, I'm reacting in the presence of peroxide. So that means that, well, there's gonna be a bond here. There's gonna be a bond here. But here I'm gonna add the hydrogen and here I'm gonna add the iodine. And so those are two examples of the different uh, products or different reactions that we just discussed and kind of how to approach that problem solving. From, a, from the other direction, we might say, How do, I, how do I approach this problem? This is a one-step synthesis problem. So I'm giving you a reactant, I'm giving you a product, and I'm saying, how do you create this? Well, so again, 
you kind of have to look at this react this product and and what do you know about it well you know that the functional group is a halogen you can see that the halogen is in the least substituted position so you're thinking about the addition of hx as a solution to the problem but you also need to have it in the presence of peroxide because it's in uh, it's an anti it was an anti Markovnikov addition. So the correct solution to this problem would be we're going to do HBr, but it's going to be in the presence of peroxide. Okay. Stop just for a beat. See if there's any questions about that. Okay, so here's the first mechanism that you have to know. It's the mechanism of the addition of HBr or HX. How does this work out? Well, we know at the end of the day, the regioselective outcome is that X adds there and H adds there. And so let's consider why this might be. And we can figure it out as soon as we know the mechanism. All right, so remember that a pi bond can act as an as a nucleophile or a base. And in this case, it's going to act as a nucleophile. So we get this situation where uh, the pi bond comes out and it seeks the electrophile. And in this case, the other thing in the solution that's an electrophile is the hydrogen. That means that this bond is gonna have to break. What does that do? If we have, again, we have two choices. I can add the hydrogen here, which would mean that this is a carbocation there. Or I could form a carbocation here and add the hydrogen there. Which one would be the preferable way to do it based on the energetics of are the favorability of forming a particular carbocation. This one might be just a little confusing because I'm sort of showing a bond to a carbocation. But I specifically want to say the cation would be in that position. At this point, you should be saying to yourself, the secondary carbocation is favored over the primary carbocation. So the species that forms is the one that has the secondary cation instead of the primary cation. So the cation forms there, which then means that the second step of the mechanism involves the, hal the halogen anion that's already now in solution acting as a nucleophile and attacking that partially positive charge or that fully positive charge and forming the product. Yeah. It's a pretty simple mechanism. It's only two steps. It involves hydro. So the step one is proton transfer. Step two is nucleophilic attack. But do you, I hope that at this point, what you're seeing is, okay, I have to know this mechanism. Maybe that's frustrating. It's maybe it's not so frustrating because it's a simple mechanism. But at the end of the day, if you know the mechanism, that you know that there is a cation that's formed, then what does that tell, lead you to think? That leads you to think that the most stable cation will form. If the most stable cation forms, then it'll form at the more substituted location and because it forms at the more substituted location, that's where the nucleophile adds. That's what leads us to the Markovnikov addition. That's why the regios chemical outcome of the mechanism is Markovnikov. All right. In addition, in addition to the regioselective outcome, which is this conversation here about having the most stable cation formed, that's where the, the 
uh, halogen is going to add, and that's how we're going to end up with the particular isomer that we end up with. What if in this process, in this reaction, let's do this. Where's the CL add? CL adds in the most substituted location. What do we know about this particular addition? This is now a chiral center. So what I'm getting at is, we've talked about the regiochemical outcome. What about the stereochemical outcome? Is this gonna be R? Is this gonna be S? Or is it gonna be racemic? We can think about this also. The answer to this question is also uh, based in the mechanism itself. Let's think about this. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna shrink this up and I'm going to redo the picture of the reaction, but now I'm gonna draw the mechanism. So proton transfer is step one, and that gets us to the intermediate. And we know that the intermediate is a carbocation and it's, fit, and it's gonna be formed at the most favorable position, most substituted position. So let's think about what that looks like. Remember that's a carbon and that carbon has three things attached to it. One of them is a methyl group. One of them is a hydrogen. And the other one is an ethyl group. Recall that it has got an unhybridized p orbital and that's what is the sort of, that's what's interacting with the nucleophile. If I have a nucleophile that is a chloride ion and it's going to attack in that location, consider the geometry of the cation. What is the geometry here? It's trigonal planar. If it's trigonal planar, then what does that mean as far as the ability of the cation to attach to one location or the other? Is it limited to being attached at the position I'm showing it? So it comes in from the top, forcing the other three groups down, or can it do this, come in from the bottom and force the other three groups up? Well, since it's planar, since it's trigonal planar, there's no limitation for its attack in either direction. So when we form a chiral center, we're going to get both possible versions we'll get both S and R. And so it's actually racemic. And so again, at the end of the day, if you know the mechanism, if you know that the chlorine attacks a carbocation and that that carbocation is trigonal planar, and because it's trigonal planar, the chlorine can attack from either side. And the fact that it can attack from either side means that both stereo outcomes are possible. Then you're, you don't really have to memorize this piece. Certainly some students will say, okay, I'm gonna take my note cards and then I'm gonna also then make a little note that says, Regio selective, it's Markovnikov, and then stereochemistry, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's racemic. But again, if you know the mechanism, you don't have to then take that extra step of memorization. You know of it, you know the answer from fundamental principles.
Any questions about that piece? Okay, so we said that we could form a carbocation intermediate. If I form a carbocation intermediate, what explains this addition? Think about this for a second. When we think about this HX reaction, our basic understanding of the mechanism is that we're going to add at the vinylic position. So we're going to add across the double bond, either at this location or at this location. But in fact, the X added here. What's the reason for that? And again, it, it really is something that we look into the mechanism to answer. Proton transfer, ooh, I don't like that color. Proton transfer forms an intermediate carbocation. We know that the most favorable carbocation is gonna form on that vinylic carbon. So it's gonna form in the secondary position. So what's gonna happen in this reaction in order to get to this final product? Because there's an intermediate carbocation formed, you must consider the possibility of a carbocation rearrangement. And that's what's explaining the uh, product in this case. There's a hydride shift going from a secondary to a tertiary carbocation. And then once we have that hydride shift and the tertiary carbocation, that's where the halogen is going to attack. And that's what gets us to this particular product. Right? So we have to think about that. When a carbocation rearrangement does occur, it will occur. And in fact, it is the major product. This is greater than 60%. This is less than 40%. No, of course, no, the tertiary is more stable than the secondary carbocation. Remember, the carbocation order of stability is methyl, least stable than primary, less stable than secondary, less stable than tertiary, which is less stable than anything that's resonance. stabilized. And that means allylic and, bin and allylic and benzylic cations. Yeah. So if a carbocation rearrangement can occur, then it will occur. And so I want to, I want to give you a, another important example of carbocation rearrangement. How do we explain this product? Remember that any resonance stabilized cation is more favorable than a tertiary cation. Typically, when we think about resonance stabilized cations, we think about allylic or we think about benzylic as having resonance stability. But let's think about this situation.
what happens if a what happens if a cation forms there? Well, I've still got two hydrogens here, and what would occur if I do a hydride shift? If I do a hydride shift in that location, now I've got an interesting possibility. The cation forms here, but now look what can happen. There's a resonance contributor here. where the charge is delocalized onto the oxygen. And since this is resonance stabilized, the primary product involves the addition of the X at that location. And we can show, we can show it going here, or we could show it there with the, with the uh, double bond moving up that way. Of course, there is another product. There are two other products. Actually, there's only one other product since it's symmetrical. It's this one. But this one is the major product, and this one is the minor product. So we typically think about allylic and benzylic cations. But remember, when there are lone pairs, the lone pairs can often participate in resonance. And that re resonance might lead to a more stable carbocation and a more stable carbo carbocation might lead to an unusual product, something that you didn't expect. And so just keep an eye out for those opportunities and to be able to sort of explain what's going on. How do you explain what's going on? Well, you have to consider rearrangements and you have to consider uh, the mechanism itself. If you know the mechanism at heart or by heart and really well absorb it into your soul, then you should be okay. I'll stop for a beat and let you guys ask any, raise any hands or ask any questions about that. Okay. So, so far we've learned two, two, reaction, two reactions. We've learned the addition of HX. We know that the addition of HX is Mar Markovnikov reg regioselectivity and the stereochemistry is uh, that it forms a racemic mixture. When it comes to um, the, addition, the other reaction, we learned the addition of HX in the presence of peroxide. And the regioselective, uh, the regioselective outcome of that reaction is that it's an anti-Markovnikov addition of the halogen. So those are the first two that we learned. The next reaction that we're going to do is uh, hydration. So the first two were called hydrohalogenation. One was the Markovnikov hydrohalogenation. The other one was the anti-Markovnikov hydrohalogenation. This one is called hydration. And this is, means exactly what you think it means. We're going to add water across a double bond. And so the basic idea behind this reaction is you have a double bond and you react it in the presence of acid. And that acid is typically H2SO4. Uh, it's got to be something that doesn't have a halogen, right? Because if you use HCl, HBr, or HI, all of these things have really good, really good nucleophiles. And so the nucleophile adds. So if we typically use H2SO4 to do this hydration. What's the outcome of this reaction? The outcome is a Markovnikov addition of an alcohol. Recall that we considered that this reaction is actually in equilibrium. We've already studied the reaction of the reverse reaction, the elimination reaction. We said that in order to make the elimination reaction happen, we use concentrated H2SO4. 
But in order to make the forward reaction happen, we use dilute H2SO4. And there was a, a kinetic uh, 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 equilibrium, sorry, concentration argument about that. In this case, remember that water is a reactant. And in this, uh, and so that means that in the forward reaction, the more water we have, the more the forward reaction is favored. This is a um, blanking at the senior moment. This is a Le Chatelier's principle thing. So in this equilibrium, the more of the, of the reactant, the more of whatever side of the reaction you add, the more it forces the reaction to the other side. And so this is the consideration. This is, this is a similar reaction to something we've already studied. But now instead of concentrated H2SO4, we use dilute H2SO4. So what do, what's going on here with the regioselective outcome? Why is the OH adding at the more substituted position? Again, the answer is in the mechanism. So if I take H3O and draw it out, And let's take a look at, then let's take a look at the mechanism. It involves the, a similar first step. It's a proton transfer. This double bond is doing the same sort of chemistry that it did before uh, in the presence of an acid. I'm of course gonna form a carbocation at the most stable location. This allows water now to add at that carbocation. I think you've already seen a mechanism sort of like this, but I've got water attached there, and now the positive charge is on the water. What happens here? How do we form the final product? Well, remember, there's plenty of water in the solution, and that's something from the exam I was trying to get you guys to think about. If I've got acid in the solution, there's also plenty of water around as well. And so the water can come along and do a proton transfer to reform the acid. And that gets me my product. So the hydration reaction you have to know is that you've got a double bond. You add it in the presence of H3O+, usually dilute H2SO4, and you're going to get a Markovnikov addition of an OH. What's the, what do you think the, uh, so that's the regiochemistry. What do you think the stereochemistry is all about? You think it's R or S or racemic, if we have something like this. Again, we're going to get a 50-50, and, and let me draw this just a little bit better. I, want, I don't want to draw a wedge. I want to draw a squiggly line because a squiggly line means it's both. So we get 50-50 racemic mixture. So again, regioselectivity is Markovnikov. Stereochemistry is 50-50 racemic mixture. So that's the third reaction. It's also a, another mechanism that you have to know. But again, it's not really a new mechanism. You, knew, you know between uh, the, the conversation that we had in Chapter 7 and the conversation we had about the addition of HX, that both of these things, uh, that both of these, these, this mechanism really isn't something that's new. So let's try a practice problem with that one real quick.
Okay. So here's a problem. What's the product? Give you a second to start to think about it. Remember that when I have dilute H2SO4 in solution, it's really H3O plus that's doing all the action. What's the product and what's the mechanism? Well, maybe, maybe you don't know the product right away. So maybe we should approach it from the perspective of, well, what's the mechanism? Let's think about the mechanism. Because if we know the mechanism, then we can predict the product, right? So what's going on here? Do I, I have water in the solution? Is water ready to attack? Or is there a better carbocation that can form? Remember that if a rearrangement can occur, it will occur. And so in this case, I'm going to get a rearrangement. Now water can attack. And another water can come along to reform the acid and do a final proton transfer in order to get me my neutral product. And so now I know what the product is. The product involves an OH in this location. I want to pause a beat and see if there's any sort of questions about that one. Any sort of questions about that one? All right, so that was, the, that was reaction number three. Let's move on to reaction number four. Reaction number three was the Markovnikov addition of an alcohol. We have another reaction that does the Markovnikov addition of an alcohol. It's called oxymercuration demercuration. It's a two-step reaction. You do have to know that both steps are done independently. In other words, if you just write HgOAC, H2O, and sodium borohydride all together without specifying that HgOAC and water are in step one, and that sodium borohydride is in step two, then that's a little bit of points off on that. So you do have to know from a synthetic standpoint that it is two steps. What that means is you do the first step in a pot, you isolate the intermediate, and then you react that intermediate in another pot with sodium borohydride and you get the product. So at the end of the day, you get the Markovnikov addition of an alcohol. Now, one of the problems with the previous reaction was that if we have a situation like this, when we added acid, we would get a rearrangement that occurred and the alcohol would form here. A different situation happens with oxymercuration, demercuration,
in that with oxymercuration, demercuration, you cannot have rearrangement. Now, the reason for the fact that it doesn't rearrange is in the mechanism. And in this course, I don't require you to know the mechanism step by step, but I do require you to be able to explain the regio selective or the fact that it doesn't rearrange. And so I'm gonna show you the mechanism and at the end of the day, you have to think about this intermediate and why, and the intermediate is why it doesn't rearrange. So what ends up happening is that we get a mercury that has a single positive charge, and that means it has a, a pair of electrons. Whoa, never done that before. Okay. This is what happens, is you get this sort of resonance picture where the mercury, the lone pair of the mercury comes back and it forms a cyclic intermediate. This is called a mercurium, mercurium ion. It's cyclic. And the reason I'm pointing out that it's cyclic is that we're going to see several different cyclic intermediates throughout the course of this chapter. If you have a cyclic intermediate, it won't rearrange. It's not possible for this cyclic intermediate to rearrange. Now, this also somewhat explains the uh, regioselective outcome. We have this situation where it's sort of resonance stabilized, and I could also show another resonance structure where we have the HgOAc attached on that side and the cation located over there. At this point, you have some practice figuring out which one of the resonance contributors is more important. Is the resonance contributor that's more important the one that has the positive charge here or the one that has the positive charge there? I think at this point you should see that the resonance contributor that is more important is this one because the carbocation is more stable or the partial charge, remember, because if we were to think about the resonance hybrid, there's going to be partial charges everywhere. The resonance hybrid has a uh, stronger positive charge in the more substituted location because that's uh, more energetically favorable. And so at the end of the day, not only does this explain the fact that there is no rearrangement possible in oxymercuration, demercuration, but it also explains the regiochemical outcome. We have this cyclic mercurium ion intermediate. Because we have this cyclic mercurium ion intermediate, it has several different resonance forms that you can think about. And those resonance forms involve uh, shifting the positive charge in different locations around that three-membered ring. The positive charge will be most favorable in the more substituted location in that three-membered ring. And so that's what's going to, that's where the nucleophile ultimately adds. And so you're ultimately going to have water add in this position here. And that's why you ultimately get the final product. That is what we would say 
we would say it's a Markovnikov edition of OH without a rearrangement possible. Any questions about that? Um, so the, the one on the left would be the more favored react, uh, product that would form. Okay, so remember that all this stuff in the middle isn't a product. It's uh, an intermediate. And so we're just, and, and remember, it's all one species. And we're showing you the resonance contributors of, those spe of that one species to sort of understand what's going on in that intermediate. Because in that idea of the resonance contributors, of course, the most important resonance contributor is the one where the, the positive charge is on the more substituted location. And so because that's the most important resonance contributor, that's the one that's going to get the addition. And that's what's going to explain the regioselective outcome of the reaction. In other words, that it's Markovnikov here. Does that help? Yes, thank you. Okay. So that's reaction number four, right? I think we've got one, two, three, four down. Let's do another one. This one is called hydroboration. Oxidation. It's also two steps, BH3 and THF reacting with, then the second step is sodium hydroxide and peroxide. The product of this reaction is the anti-Markovnikov addition of an alcohol. This reaction is extremely important. It sh comes up over and over again, not only in Orgo 1, but in Orgo 2. This is the anti-Markovnikov addition. Of an alcohol. Hydroboration oxidation. All right, in this reaction, I don't expect you to know uh, the mechanism, but let's take a look at this. What if I do this reaction? What about the stereochemistry here? Well, we know that the OH is going to add at the least substituted position. But what does that mean about its relative positions in a, with a stereochemical consideration? This is what's observed. We get the pair of enantiomers, but only these two. We get only sin addition. So the regioselective consideration is that uh, the OH adds at the least substituted location. The stereochemical outcome is that it's sin addition. Now, of course, it's racemic. We get both versions of the enantiomer. But it, the part about syn addition really is important when it comes into rings. 
because remember rings have bonds that go that face in and out or up and down and so the, the, especially when we talk about something like you know like i think the example we used was one two dimethyl cyclohexane remember there's actually four different versions of that which we explained was actually only three different uh unique molecules but in, in, in other words we don't get products where the H adds up, the CH3 is here, and then the OH is here. This product and its enantiomer don't occur. We only get syn addition where the water, the H and the OH, add in the same direction. And so what we want to do is we sort of want to explain what's going on with that and, and why that is. Or we can explain certainly the hydroboration oxidate, we can explain the uh, stereochemical, the regioselective outcome. And again, it does involve the intermediate. And so what I'm going to draw is I'm going to draw only the, the sort of the intermediate to kind of get an idea of what's going on with that. Why is it anti-Markovnikov? So we've got BH3 hanging about. And we get a, a somewhat similar cyclic intermediate where there's partial bonds formed. It's not exactly the same situation as before because we're talking about a partial bond to hydrogen and partial bonds to boron. So in other words, the BH3 interacts with the double bond in a transition state to ultimately form this species. So let's think about this transition state that forms. If you have to have this double bond interacting with the BH3 in order to form the transition state, which one of these transition states will form? Which one is bigger, boron or hydrogen? Hopefully you should say to yourself, well, boron's larger. So it's more favored from a steric perspective to, inter to interact with the least substituted location. Ultimately, if it interacts at the least substituted location, then the BH3 adds anti-Markovnikov. Remember, this is sterics. And ultimately, it's the BH3, or the BA, in this case, it's the BH2. This is what gets oxidized. So hydroboration, this is the hydroboration step. And then the oxidation step is what leads you to the final product. And this is what it helps us understand why it's anti-Markovnikov. Now, I, in my course, I certainly don't ask you to know, uh, to ask you to know about the, the regioselective outcome, or excuse me, I don't ask you to know the mechanism. You definitely have to know the regioselective and the stereoselective outcome, but you don't have to know the mechanism. What you should know, though, is that, is this part, is that BH3 interacts with the double bond. It interacts with the double bond to form this four-membered, partially bonded cyclic transition state. And because it forms this, this cyclic transition state, the, the one that's less sterically hindered gets formed first, where you end up with the 
substrate attached to a boron. The substrate attached to the boron is going to be at the boron is going to be at the least substituted location because of that steric consideration. Ultimately, the B, the boron is what becomes oxidized and turned into the OH group, and so that's what explains the fact that it becomes uh, uh, what be, what becomes the the alcohol. Yeah, the double dagger is the transition state symbol. Okay, and so it's stereo specific in the sense that it's only sin addition. Now, remember that's going to come into most of the, that's really only going to come into play uh, in rings, but it also could come into play in a situation like this. How many new chiral centers are formed here? Let me write the product down without specifying stereochemistry. And we can examine how many chiral centers are formed. Well, we formed two chiral centers here and there. So we have to be extremely careful in specifying the stereochemistry of, these, of this particular reaction. Remember, it's stereoselective, and it's only syn addition. If we have two stereocenters, what's the possible number of stereoisomers? The total possible number of stereoisomers is four. But because of the limitation of syn addition, we actually only get a pair of enantiomers. And so when we draw out the products, we should draw out the products with that stereo specificity in mind. What that means is that we have to show the OH and the H going in the correct direction. So one of the enantiomers involves the CH3 coming out, which means the H goes aw is away. And if the H is away, then that means that the OH is also away and the hydrogen here comes out. The enantiomer that you get is the other syn addition product. In that case, we would say the hydrogen comes towards you and the CH3 goes away from you, then that means in this case, the OH must come towards you and the hydrogen must go away from you. These are the only two syn addition enantiomers that are gonna form. Another way to put it is that no diastereomers form only enantiomers. So it's a simple reaction, especially when we consider it like this. No chiral centers, no worry, just put the OH in the correct regioselective location. But when there's chiral centers that are formed, it's crucial, especially when two chiral centers are formed. And so this particular piece is what hangs up students a lot, is really kind of getting a good feel for this, uh, this particular situation. And so let's, let's real quick, let's, uh, this particular situation from a stereochemical perspective, let's do a quick practice problem real quick. I'm going to draw that just a little better. Okay, let's do hydroboration. Oxidation. Let's predict the product. 
It may be helpful to first draw the product without any stereochemistry in consideration. You know you have to do the stereochemistry, but maybe it's helpful to just understand what the product is going to be without the stereochemistry involved. Now, of course, does anything change at this location? Nothing, nothing changes at this location. All right, so now how do we deal with the stereochemistry? Nothing is changing at, with this location. This is not doing any reacting. But remember, we have sin addition is what's going on here. So we can show the OH going out, in which case we must show the hydrogen going out, and that means the CH3 group goes in. And in this case, since there are three chiral centers and only the two change, Oh, uh, there's only going to be these two products where the OH and the H both go the same direction and are now uh, going down. In this case, is this a set of enantiomers? Are these enantiomers? No, they're not enantiomers in this case, right? Because you, th uh, there are three chiral centers. The two chiral centers that formed from the hydroboration oxidation, but there's also the chiral center that was here to begin with. And that chiral center didn't change. So if you're forming brand new stereocenters and they're the only stereocenters that are formed, you clearly get a set of enantiomers and no diastereomers formed. But if you have other chiral centers on the molecule, they're not going to change. And so you do end up with diastereomers. And so again, a real simple reaction from the basic standpoint that it's an anti-Markovnikov addition of an alcohol. But the addition of the stereoselectivity, the syn addition, is a significant consideration when we think about the stereochemical results. The two, the hydrogen and the oxygen add in the same, at the same side. Because they add on the same side of the double bond, the fit, up, either up, either above or below, that has a stereochemical consideration, uh, that forces a stereochemical consideration to be made. Any questions about that? That's sort of a, that's sort of a big piece of information Type in the chat or raise your hand on the Zoom window if you have any questions about that. Okay, let's think. Where are we at? Still got time. All right, what's going on? We've got well, that, that was reaction number five, I think it was. One, two, three, four, five. That's reaction number five. We're almost halfway there with all of our reactions for this chapter. Let's do the next one. The next one is fairly straightforward as well. We're going to take an alkene, and we're going to do catalytic hydrogenation. You think about what that means is we're going to take a catalyst and we're going to use that to add some, hydro some hydrogens. So the question is, so the CH3 and the OH are on the same side in the terms of stereochemistry. Uh, so in the previous example, which is the example over here, if you can still see it, the CH3 that was already on the molecule, doesn't, nothing happens to it because it's not involved in the reaction. 
So saying that the CH3 and the OH, if that's the CH3 you're talking about, are on the same side, no, that's not, that's not necessarily true. Because if you take a look at these two products, you see that the OH and the CH3 at, at the top are in different directions. This is true about the other CH3 at the bottom. The, it's not the CH3 that's involved in the chemistry. It's the addition of water. I'm adding H and OH. What is added in a sin fashion is the H and OH. So uh, I would again say no, the CH3 and the OH are not on the same side in terms of stereochemistry. It's the OH and the H that are in the same direction. The CH3 that is attached to the double bond in the reactant it has to move in relation to that fact that OH and H are in the same direction. That CH3 attached to the double bond can go up or down no because of the fact that OH and H can add either above or below. Now, the other CH3 on the, the chiral center that's already there, it doesn't move at all because it's not involved in the reaction. Hope that helps. At the end, can you list all of the reactions? Yeah, we'll go, I'll, I'll spend three minutes and I'll just go through all the reactions and write them all down again. Okay, and so here we go. Catalytic hydrogenation. We take a double bond and what are we going to add to it? We're going to add H2 to it and we're going to use a catalyst. In this case, it's often platinum. And that's the product. Okay. We don't really have to consider regioselectivity because, of course, we're adding the same thing. We're adding two hydrogens. So no regioselectivity is necessary to be observed. But there is a stereochemical consideration. Let's take this guy. Put some methyl groups there. Let's do catalytic hydrogenation. And let's see what we get. We get a pair of enantiomers in this case as well, or uh, let's make it something that is an antimers. We get this guy and we get that guy. So those are the only two that are formed. Again, why is that the case? Now the case involves the reaction mechanism, but this is also another mechanism that you don't have to know. This is syn addition. Of H2. The H2 is obviously adding at the same side, whether it's up, Or down. It's sin addition. Why is it sin? You don't have to know the mechanism, but you have to know the details that explain uh, why this is going on the way it is. And it involves this catalyst. And what I'm drawing is the atomic surface of the platinum catalyst. So I've got this platinum. These are the atoms of this platinum catalyst. And they're all lined up in a nice array and of course I'm not really showing a nice array but remember it's all going to be perfectly packed and then I've got some hydrogen hanging about now what's going on with this hydrogen this hydrogen is interacting with the catalyst and it's absorbed onto the surface of the catalyst. So at the end of the day, hydrogen on the surface of the catalyst. So what happens when I've got this double bond that comes around to do some reacting? Well, what happens then? Now I'm going to redraw this surface. I'm not going to draw the whole thing out, but I'm going to draw just a few rows of atoms so that you can see what I'm talking about.
Well, you still have this hydrogen. But now it's attached to the molecule that has the double bond in it. And now I'm not showing this as a ring structure, but because the hydrogen is ad adhered to the, ad adsorbed onto the surface of the catalyst, the next hydrogen that adds, adds in the same direction because it's stuck on that surface. So if this thing were a ring, let's erase it and let's draw it as a ring. then that means that it, the hydrogens are going to form either, either both up or both down because they're adding from the same side. So you don't have to know this mechanism, but you do have to know this idea that what happens with the catalyst is that the hydrogen attaches to the surface. And because the hydrogen attaches to the surface, it's, it, it, the two hydrogens add on the same side of the double bond, either above or below. It, when it's a, a straight chain alkane, that's or alkene, it doesn't matter because remember there's going to be free rotation around the, a single bond. But when that is locked into place with a ring, it does matter because it, th that means that the hydrogen can only add either above or below the plane of the ring. Any questions about that then? Pause for a beat. Let's see where we're at on the time. Still got a couple of minutes here. All right, let's see. I think we can do one more. We can do one more reaction before we. Yeah, so the question's been asked twice. At the end, can you list all the reactions? And I'll answer it again. Definitely, I'll draw all the reactions out at the end. Don't make me grumpy. So this one is called halogenation. This is the one where we add both halogens across the double bond. It's fairly straightforward. There's not a regioselective consideration to be made. Uh, really, the only two halogens we can do this with are Br2 or Cl2. The problem with uh, fluorine is that it replaces everything starts going off and replaces hydrogens as well. And iodine is too, too good of a leaving group, it likes to pop back off. And so really we're, really we're gonna be limited to only Br2 and Cl2. So since, they're at, since the groups that are added are the same, just like before, there isn't a regiochemical consideration to be made, but there is a stereochemical consideration to be made. Unlike the hydro hydrogenation reaction, which was syn addition, this one is anti addition. And if we do something like add a group here, 
to make it different, we really do get two different products. And get a more interesting stereochemical mix of products. All right. And so why is this the way it is? Again, this is going to be something that's involved in the mechanism. And this is a mechanism that you have to know. And so let's draw this one out. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with the cyclic reactant. So we can see how this goes. Okay. This is what happens. It's similar to our previous mechanisms, but in this case, there isn't a, a carbocation that forms, right? If this was the exact same mechanism as before, then we would have this situation where we would have a bromine that was added here. If this were the mechanism, and then we would have a carbocation that would form here. If the carbocation formed there, then the bromine, the next bromine could add either up or down. And we'd get a lot more than just the two products that are anti-addition. So since we observe only anti-addition and not syn addition, this means that this is not the correct mechanism. So what is going on here? What we get in the mechanism is that at the same time one of the bromines attacks, or uh, one of the bromines is attacked, that bromine has a lone pair of electrons and that lone pair of electrons attacks back into the, uh, into the vinyl, vinylic position where the double bond was. And so what you get is, and now I want to draw, actually, I want to draw, I think it's called a Hayworth. Shelly can tell me if I'm right or wrong about that. Let's draw this Hayworth projection. I'm going to put this on its side. And this is what happens. We get a cyclic bromonium ion. It, I hope that you can see that in this cyclic bromonium ion, the bromine is attached to both vinylic positions. In this case, I'm showing it below. So where does the next bromide attack? Can the bromide attack from below again? The answer is not very good. I can't do that very well because of the steric hindrance of the bromine being attached at both locations. And so it attacks from the other direction. Since it attacks from the other direction and the intermediate is a cyclic bromonium ion, that's what gets us one going down and the other going up. That's the mechanism and why what we use to describe the situation here. Of course, we also get the enantiomer, right? The EN, I'm just gonna abbreviate it EN. So it's, it's, a, it's another version of backside attack. There's a backside attack of the cyclic bromonium ion, leaving one bromine facing the other direction uh, than the, than one bromine facing the other direction than the other bromine. And so that's it on the mechanism. It's fairly straightforward. It's just different in the sense that there's this cyclic intermediate. Again, I'd like to point out, this is the second time we've seen a cyclic intermediate and cyclic intermediates are gonna provide us with lots of explanation for some of the stereochemical and regioselective outcomes of these reactions. In the first case, it was oxymercuration, demercuration, uh, forming a mercurium ion, and that the mercurium ion, uh, we could show it had a resonance structure, and that 
that was the reason why this fact that it was cyclic was the reason why it didn't rearrange. Uh, and, th and then we showed a, we use, we invoked a cyclic transition state that had a steric consideration, why hydroboration oxidation was anti-Markovnikov in its regioselectivity. And now we're using a cyclic intermediate to describe why the, the halogenation reaction is an anti-addition reaction uh, because the intermediate carbocation is actually a three-membered ring. In this case of bromonium ion, in the case of chlorine, it would be a chloronium ion. But at the end of the day, it's still a similar reaction to the mechanisms to the ones that you already know, and you do have to know this one. So at this time, I'm gonna stop with this reaction uh, we still, I think we're about halfway done with the numbers of reactions. We had halohydrin, anti -di dihydroxylation, both anti and sen uh, oxidative cleavage. So we're actually more than halfway done with the reactions. And so let's, uh, let's stop there, just pause a beat to see if anybody has any questions about those particular reactions. And then I'll just re, I'll just re go over all the reactions. Okay. Here are the reactions that we did. Addition of HX. Markovnikov. We did addition of HX in the presence of peroxide. Anti-Markovnikov. We did addition of water with dilute H2SO4. Markovnikov. We did another Markovnikov alcohol addition, oxymercuration, demercuration. So it's HgOAC2 uh, water, then sodium borohydride. And that was also a Markovnikov addition. We did the anti-Markovnikov addition, which was hydroboration, oxidation. This is anti-Markovnikov addition. We did catalytic hydrogenation. And finally, we did halogenation. You have to know the mechanisms of this one, this one, and this one. You have to know details of the mechanisms here, here, and here to explain the regioselective or stereoselective outcomes respectively. The only thing we haven't talked about anything with the mechanism is this one because it's a radical mechanism. And we'll talk about that in chapter 10. Uh, let's, so just, just to kind of go back and summarize, this one was Markovnikov. And the stereochemical outcome was racemic. This one is anti-Markovnikov. We didn't talk about serochemistry because we don't have the reaction. This one is Markovnikov and racemic. This one was Markovnikov, and it's also racemic. But the other problem we have to worry about here is rearrangement. Here we have to, we don't have to worry about rearrangement. This one, BH3 THF, is anti Markovnikov.
It's also racemic. This one was sin addition. This one was anti addition. Make sure I got that right. No, this one is not. This isn't racemic. This one is also sin addition. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to stop the recording there. Unmute anybody who wants to be unmuted and feel free to let kind of free flow go there at that point. So we got seven reactions down and we've got, I think, four more to go. Anybody got anything or is that good enough for you? Um, can you put that screen back up? I didn't finish copying that down, sorry. Josh, it's in a video. I'm going to post it in about five minutes. Oh, you're so true. That's so true. <laughs> Any other questions? How are you feeling about those reactions? That's a handful. There's going to be a lot more than that. So really got to get chapter eight reactions down. Because if you get chapter eight reactions down, then you've got chapter nine reactions down. And so remember, I'm going to put at least part of chapter nine on uh, uh, solo, uh, not synchronous. The parts of chapter nine that are vastly different than chapter eight, I will put, we'll do synchronously. Questions going once. Questions going twice. Remember, if you're working through some problems, let me know. I'll put up chapter eight homework here yet today so you can start working on that. I can do Zoom appointments. We can work on homework together, whatever you want to do. Uh, but we got to keep pushing through it so that you're ready for the fall and uh, we can all get the grade we want to in this course. Of course, if you don't get the grade that you want to in this course, feel free to sign up for my summer class. Anything else? I'm going to hang up on everybody now that y'all are so quiet and distraught. Thank you. All right, bye. Yeah, guys. Yeah, have a nice day, everybody. All right. See ya. See ya.